If you've gone through the process of buying a home and getting approved for a home loan in the last few years, you know that the process has gotten a lot more complex than it was in the early 2000s prior to the uh, meltdown that we went through in the mortgage crisis and the economy at large crisis at that time. So there's been a lot of changes since that time uh, to the mortgage industry. We came into the industry in 1999. We went through all of that. We've seen the changes and are very aware of the experience difference that you may encounter if you bought a home back then versus buying a home now. And so oftentimes we see people who are maybe at times getting a little bit frustrated about the process. So I just want to take a couple minutes, discuss some of those areas for you and maybe help alleviate the process if you go through the home buying process anytime in the near future. So one of the areas that causes frustration sometimes is the fact that we have to have every page of any document that we need in the mortgage industry. So primarily this is like bank statements. So if it's a seven page bank statement, we actually need all seven pages. And again, the things that I'm talking to you about today isn't about this lender or that lender. These are set by the agencies in Washington, DC, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, FHA, VA, USDA. Each of those agencies set the, their own guidelines. In many cases, those rules apply across the board into general underwriting practices. And whether it's a bank statement, maybe it's a divorce decree, whatever the case may be, if you have a document that has multiple pages, even if one of the pages says page left intentionally blank, which we see that quite often with bank statements, we need that page. And it may sound ridiculous. I understand that. But the idea behind that is the, if the underwriter doesn't see that it's blank, then they don't know that it's blank. So there could be some damaging information on there, if you would, or something that would negatively impact the file. And that's their job to make sure that there's nothing in the file that would damage the file. So they do have to take a look at all of those pages. Another area that is frustrating sometimes is the way that income has to be calculated. So if you're working on a job and you may have missed some time and you're making $30 an hour, but you might have missed a week of work in February or whatever the case may be, then that's going to trigger the fact that now we have to look at your file as variable income. And so what that triggers is that now we have to average your income out instead of just using $30 an hour times 40 hours a week times 52 weeks a year divided by 12 months to get a monthly income. At that point, we have to average the income. And then at that point, your average is going to be a little bit lower because of the time missed. Now, if you receive PTO, holiday pay, essentially, if you're getting paid for the time that you're off, then it will show up in another category and we won't have to take the uh, income averaging approach. Besides the income averaging overtime, bonus, commission, each of those have their own rules in terms of the way that the income must be looked at when calculating the income. Over time, you're going to have to have a history of it. Same thing with bonus. Again, the same thing with commissions. We have to be able to show a history of receiving those types of income. We can't just go get a job today or very recently showing those types of income and be able to count that as viable income. What the underwriter wants to see and what the guidelines require is that we show stable income. So if this is a new type of income and it doesn't have the track record, then we are not going to be able to count that income as stable. Source of funds is another thing that sometimes people find frustrating. So obviously, if you're bringing money into the transaction or you need money for purchase or if you need money for down payment, closing costs, maybe you're paying off a debt, we have to be able to document where those funds came from. Now, this has always been a case in the mortgage industry, but it, it has even gotten worse, if you will, since the Patriot Act and the documentation required related to financial institutions and financial transactions. And so we have to be able to see and document where those funds came from. There's also acceptable source of funds and unacceptable source of funds. So for us to be able to document and prove that we meet the agency guidelines regarding source of funds, we have to show where those funds came from. So gift funds are acceptable. Borrowed funds are not acceptable. So you're not allowed to go out and borrow money for a down payment or borrow money from a closing cost. The exception to this is you can borrow money from your 401k or from some other financial asset that you own, because essentially at that point, you're borrowing the money from yourself. Sometimes people get irritated. Why do you need to know where this money came from? Maybe I want it in a poker game, or maybe I want it at the casino, or maybe I got it from whatever the case may be. Just know that the agencies require, we have to be able to show where the money came from. 
if it's been deposited in the last two months or last one month. So some cases it's 30 days or one month, some other cases it's 60 days or two months. So if something was deposited into your bank account 90 days ago, then the odds are we won't need to document where that money came from because it's been sitting in your bank long enough to be seasoned. Another area that oftentimes causes frustration is when we have to get letters of explanation regarding delinquent or negative items on a borrower's credit report. Now, this is usually only required whenever we have a manual underwrite. So if we're able to run the file through Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, uh, automated underwriting engines or uh, USDA rural developments underwriting engine, and we're able to get a automated approval, it's taking into account those negative items, giving the approval. And at that point, in most cases, we don't have to require a uh, letter of explanation to explain what happened to cause that negative impact to your credit report. However, in the case where we can't get the automated approval and we are looking to manually underwrite the file, in those cases we need to document or at least get a letter from the borrower talking about why those things happened, why were you late, what happened. And generally what they're wanting to see is that you don't have a general disregard for your financial obligations. Oftentimes bad things happen to good people and there's difficulties with credit. Underwriters understand that, but they're wanting, what they're wanting to document is that you just don't have a blatant disregard for your financial obligations. So they want an explanation as to what happened to this late payment, that late payment, what caused this bankruptcy, what caused this foreclosure. And generally speaking, especially in the case of the larger credit events, bankruptcy, foreclosure, they want to see that, that something happened to you outside of your control and not likely to happen again. So whatever the issue may be that you have been able to remedy that situation and there's reason to believe that you'll be able to manage your financial obligations going forward. So I hope this helps you understand a little bit about the mindset of the underwriter and the reason for some of the guidelines that we have to deal with. And again, know that these guidelines for the most part are all required by the agencies and the rule makers in Washington, D.C. Each lender that you deal with will have to deal with these same guidelines and these same rules in terms of underwriting. If you're getting a loan from a local bank and they're making you a portfolio loan, what that means is they're going to hold on to it. They're not making an FHA, VA, USDA, Fannie Mae, or Freddie Mac loan. They're just making a loan out of their funds. At that point, they can make their own rules, their own guidelines, and they don't have to live by and they don't have to abide by the established norms set by the agencies. And so I hope this helps a little bit. Hope it helps you understand maybe a little bit better what to expect when the time comes for you to go through the loan approval and underwriting process.